one of the reasons Mrs. America has been such an effective limited series is because of the fantastic score that was composed by musician Chris Bowers, and he joins us here today. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and the first question I want to ask is, uh, did, did you use specific instruments to communicate certain aspects of different characters? <laughs> yeah, so one of the first things that uh, Davi wanted me to look at was creating a theme or a sound for uh, both the Foolish Laughly Stop ERA side and the feminist side. And one of the first things that came to mind was um, the, the piece Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, it was in the script for episode three, and um, they were basically contrasting that song with another song called um, Move On Over which is a um, an activist protest song that's based on the same melody and um, harmonic structure as Battle Hymn. And so one of the first things I did was looked at that Battle Hymn um, arrangement that they referenced and wanted to see if there's anything in that that I could find that could become um, sonic identifiers for Phyllis Lafley uh, and the Stop ERA side. And so it started to get, because of that, this very traditional sound uh, and mil militaristic sound where I was incorporating a lot of snare drums um, and, uh, and also the same march pattern <clears throat> as Battle Hymn of the Republic uh, appears a number of times early on uh, in the series as a sound for Phyllis and the Stop Yere side. And overall, that whole sound is again, a bit more traditional. There's much more of an orchestral sound. Um, the woodwinds are much more present in Phyllis's uh, material. And then on the feminist side, it was about trying to incorporate more modern elements. And so one of the first things that I thought of was, again, going for that protest sound, um, you know, thinking, what are the sounds of protest? And that for me was uh, found percussion sounds. So hand claps, tambourines, even like beating the side of, of uh, boxes or uh, plastic jugs or different things like that. And um, in addition to that, this taking place in the 70s, I thought about the beginning of synthesizers and synth music. And so the feminist side has a little bit more uh, synth in the sound, as well as guitar. There's more electric guitar in the in the feminist side. And so, especially early on in the series, those two sides are pretty distinct. Um, and as the series continues, those sounds get a little bit more um, muddy than the, the line between the two is a little bit more blurred. Was there a character or, uh, or a barred character, uh, one of the sides of the, uh, uh, ERA argument that you got that you really got a kick out of writing the music for uh, more than the other. So I found Phyllis Schlafly and the Sapi ERA side to be the most interesting. Uh, in reading the scripts, I felt like I was so taken aback by how they approached her character in this very unbiased way and treated her very much like a human. And um, I was saying that I think about my own family um, and. You know, I think we all have people that in our lives that we maybe don't agree with uh, or see eye to eye with, but we still have to uh, be with or, or get along with. And there are times where um, I might love somebody or <clears throat> have feelings for somebody that go beyond um, our viewpoints. And with that, you have to be em uh, empathetic. That's where empathy comes in, right? And so having a character like that that I don't dis I don't agree with on a lot of her standpoints and um, political stances I think is uh, interesting because then I have to see I have to be empathetic I have to treat her like a human when I'm composing for her and for me that's the kind of material that you know can get the average person to see the other side in a different way right like to to see somebody that maybe they didn't agree with on um, on some of their most fundamental values and beliefs, but now you can start to see them as as a, a human and empathize with them. And so being able to approach Phyllis with the score in that way was a very uh, unique challenge that I really, really embraced. 
So one of the interesting things about the uh, series is, of course, it takes place over the course of the 1970s and then the very early 80s. Uh, and uh, one of the great things about doing something that takes place in that era is that there's a lot of great music that already exists uh, to, to draw from to establish, you know, uh, you know, the setting of everything. And I'm, I'm curious, are, uh, are, were you at all involved in the discussion of as to whether to have at certain points have an original composition as opposed to a pre-existing song? I, I was involved in those conversations because Mary Ramos, the music supervisor at times, um, asked if I could help uh, with creating some of those source pieces. Uh, there are times where either they felt budget-wise it'd be better to save money for a bigger song in another place and then have me take a look at you know, providing the music in the background of um, Jill's house, for example, or something like that. But then there were other times where it felt like score would um, comment on the picture a little bit better, right? So there are times where I think about an episode or episode seven, there's a whole sequence where they're <clears throat> both reviewing um, statements that either side is, is releasing about an event that's coming up. And um, you know, there's this high energy feeling to it, but they wanted it to have a modern sound or modern relative to the time that we're in for the show. And so originally there was a source cue there that was giving us that feeling <clears throat> in this, um, I forget what it was, but it was a, a rock and roll song um, of that era that was giving us this propulsion. And so originally we tried it just as score and the sound of the score or in the palette that we'd established for the score, and that didn't work so well. It felt uh, it didn't didn't have the energy that they really felt the the rock sound song had. And so, then my job was to try to create a piece of score that palette wise sounded like the source, but could still function like score as far as where it was matching the cuts and and escalating or coming down in in different sections. And so, yeah, I'd say that this was a project that um, I was more involved with that side of things than I have been in the past. Um, and again, I think a lot of that has to do with Mary's creativity uh, with trying to figure out how to best utilize both their budget with the, um, the source cues and also how to utilize me as a composer. Uh, uh, in addition to the already existing sounds of the 70s and 80s, I mean, the, the, just those decades alone have a very uh, have a very have very distinctive tones to them, and I'm wondering. Uh, you mentioned the synthesizers earlier. Uh, do you did you find yourself drawing from any of the other distinctive sounds of the 70s and early 80s, uh, uh, other than just the synthesizers? You know, other than the synths, it was really just guitar, uh, and that really didn't come into play until um, I mean, it first comes in in Shirley's episode, in episode three, and um, as we see her. You know, making these huge strides um, for women, for for the black community, for black women, and um, the guitar becomes a little bit more present there uh, than it ever has before, and it grows throughout the course of the season, where it becomes a little bit more of a character um, as we go, and it really comes to a head at the the epilogue in the end of episode nine. I think has. I don't even know, maybe like eight layers of guitar or something like that. And so um, that was one of the only other sounds that we utilized that was very, very time specific to try to give us that feeling of of, um, of angst or just anti-establishment or, um, yeah, any of that type of emotion, I think, came from adding a little bit of grit with guitar and, and some of the synths. I'm, I'm, I'm always curious, whenever I interview composers, I always try to ask them, was there a scene that they that you had uh, composed something for before seeing uh, what the actual uh, 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 filmed product would look like, and then it just didn't match up? Uh, it didn't match up, and you had to go back to the drawing board for that one scene? Hmm, that's a really good question. I feel like there are a number of times where that happened. Um, I didn't do that much writing before we were writing the picture. Like there are times on other projects where I'm writing cues uh, not to picture at all. <clears throat> but in general, in my process, I usually start with picture and then I step away from picture for a while just to develop the 
piece on a musical level and a, an emotive level without getting distracted by any of the other things in the picture. And a couple of the times that I can think of that are one in um, episode one, there's a scene where uh, John, uh, uh, John Schlafly comes home and, uh, or not John, Fred, <laughs> his real name is John, the actor, uh, but Fred comes home and um, he is aroused and wants to uh, make love to Phyllis and she's not in the mood. And I think that scene is really uncomfortable because, um, you know, it's it's honestly bordering on uh, not rape, but it's, it feels, it doesn't feel entirely consensual. And, and um, yeah, at the same time, uh, she's, she's his wife and it's a very uncomfortable scene. And that scene, I think a few times I would ride away from picture. And I think that I either went too far in the direction of, of danger or aggression and it felt a little too dark and it felt a little um, too close to rape or something like that. And then, and then um, there are times where it felt maybe a little too sad and it wasn't entire and it made Phyllis feel a little bit too much like a victim and it wasn't um, um, showing her anger or frustration with what, what was happening. And, and, um, and then when it goes out of that scene into her just being by herself, um, you know, how did that feel? And so I think that was a pretty tough scene for me to figure out how to approach in the best way. And every time I stepped away from the scene, um, I tried to write something and I felt like I actually got a little bit, a little further away from what was needed. Um, and then the other one that was difficult was uh, the epilogue in episode nine. Uh, that was one where I, it's such a long piece of music. I think it's almost four minutes long and it's this long montage where we have to feel, um, you know, the rise and fall of what we're seeing <clears throat> on screen. They're kind of giving a, a history of what's been happening with, the ERA since the end of this series to present day. And I'm trying to match every single shift with something that really just needed to be done to picture. There were so many times where I tried to just work on the piece, um, not to picture because I felt like it's just a, you know, three and a half, four minute piece that just needed to build. And if I just work away from picture, I can figure out how to craft it to the picture a little bit later. And um, I was finding that I really needed to do it to picture so that um, I could match every one of the, the shifts to help with the structure of the, of the arc of the piece. So you actually uh, have composed music for all different kinds of mediums, film, television, uh, your own musical compositions, video games, documentaries. Uh, is there any one that you enjoy that you enjoy composing for more than the others? You know, I definitely don't have a favorite. For me, the thing that, the reason I love music is because it's, it's um, a language, it's like the language of emotion, right? It's, it's something that no matter what genre you're in um, or language you're in, you can still feel what's, what's trying to be said. And, um, for me, I grew up listening to so many different styles of music and had such a, a deep connection to so many different styles of music that that started to make sense to me. Like I could feel just as um, uh, excited by, you know, listening to something from uh, Duke Ellington or Oscar Peterson to listening to Dr. Dre or Eminem or listening to uh, Steve Reich or, or Philip Glass or listening to John Williams or listening to Ravel, like it, it all makes me, I can find an example from each one of those artists where I would feel a similar level of energy um, or have a similar reaction. Like there's something we always say in, in jazz, there's like the jazz face where you hear something that, that you can't really explain. You just make an ugly face because it's like, oh, that was, that was a, uh, so interesting or so unexpected or whatever it is. And um, I mean, there are times where I make that face watching dance or watching basketball or whatever it is, right? Like it's a, it's an emotive response. And so for me with music that, um, that can be found across genres. And that's the most fascinating thing to me that I can figure out if I'm working on Madden and it's 
um, you know, something that's really intense and has uh, more of a hip hop beat to it, what is going to get me really excited and really energized? But then same thing with Mrs. America, what's a cue that's, what's a sound that's going to get me that same level of like, oh, things are moving along and I feel really energized. And um, the feeling you get is not that different. The feeling you get is, is very similar. So then what is it about the music um, internally that's, that's giving us that feeling? And so for me, I, I'm, I'm just fascinated by trying to discover that no matter what genre, sound, um, or style it is. And um, working on so many different things I think just continues to show me how how many similarities there are across the board. So you actually also uh, have gotten quite a bit of recognition recently. Last year you were nominated for uh, a primetime Emmy for uh, uh, your scoring of When They See Us, but you also uh, won a daytime Emmy in 2017. And I'm curious as to what the uh, what was it like, uh, you know, to get nominated last year and to win a couple of years ago? What's what's that whole process been like for you? It's been interesting for me. I mean, like, one, very surreal, because I've been thinking about, um, you know, being a composer ever since I was a kid. And so being recognized on the level of so many of my heroes and, and being nominated along with so many of my heroes is really surreal. Uh, and I, I really didn't imagine that I would um, do it uh, at this this stage in my career, this early in my career, and um, I feel really lucky for that. And um, and I think the other side of it is I've been trying to just get my own get a gauge of my own relationship with all of it because you know my um, I grew up being uh, uh, encouraged to be incredibly competitive. Like my my father was pretty competitive and and really tried to instilled that in me most of my life and I feel like my discovery of jazz is what um, made me feel uh, most comfortable because it wasn't about competition um, in its purest form and I think at the end of the day everything can be turned into a competition but when something's in its purest form it's incredibly democratic it's all about sharing it's all about how you can communicate uh, and that's when I really started to fall in love with it. But um, a big part of that competition is is awards recognition, right? And so when I was younger, I think that the more I fell in love with the um, sharing aspect of, of music and jazz in particular and creativity, the more that I felt like um, awards just don't matter at all. And, and that's really what it is, right? Like I, I remember when I won that daytime Emmy, I, um, I, that night, I remember I was working on something with Kobe Bryant and he sent me a text, uh, just saying, congratulations. Like, this is amazing, blah, blah, blah. And, and I was like, yeah, no, I know, but I got work to do for you. I have something I'm, I'm going to get back to my place and, and work on that tonight and, and, um, send that to you. And there's something else I got to do. And I was like, the work continues. And he actually was like, he was like, man, but you should celebrate this moment. You should really feel this. And at the time, I think that I heard him and I was, one, taken aback that, that that's how he, or that, that was his advice to me was to really feel the moment and, and to not think so much about, like, uh, all the work that I had to do. Um, but I don't think I really absorbed it because I remember even then going to work on When They See Us, I was working on it uh, at the same time during the Oscars campaign for Green Book. And so literally the night of the Oscars, we went to the Oscars, me and my um, well, now wife uh, went to um, uh, the after parties. And then that night I came home and took a 30 minute nap. And then I went to work on When They See Us for the rest of the night because I had a meeting with Ava the, the very next morning. And um, for me, that felt normal. For me, that felt like, like there's no reason to celebrate. Like that daytime Emmy that I had sat on my floor for months because I didn't really care about it or want to look at it or any of that and um and i think now i've been trying to get better at at uh you know being nominated for when they see us i think felt so special and i was so appreciative that that um that taking a moment to actually look back and say like, wow that's that's amazing that i've i've been able to 
have this accomplishment and, and um, you know, recognize all the work that it took to get there and all that stuff made it um, feel a little bit easier to dive back into the work. And so I think that for the most part, it's really lately just been um, uh, interesting to find a balance between using the the recognition for for moments of like patting yourself on the back or you know embracing yourself for the work that you've done but then at the same time um remembering that the work continues so you know i think i've i've gone back and forth on the on the scale as far as like mostly on the side of just like not even thinking about any sort of recognition or, or awards and and um uh, outside of what they represent but as far as like how they make me feel not really like feeling anything to now trying to like take a little bit of that uh, just to, to feel good from now and then. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Chris. We wish you all the best this Emmy season. And to all our viewers, please remember to like and subscribe to this channel uh, to get all the latest content from us. And be sure to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks, Charlie.